Um, hello, everyone. Hope uh, you guys had enjoyed your tea time. So now we'll be starting this session. Uh, we'd like to invite everyone who is standing outside, please. If you're interested in, in this session, you can come in. I think people are afraid of rocking inside the village. They're, they're running away. <laughs> Okay, everyone, seems like you guys are really enjoying your tea time. Uh, so, but uh, we'll move forward, move ahead. Uh, hopefully, you guys are having a good afternoon. So, we have three speakers in this uh, afternoon here today. We present you, uh, Mr. Shushio Toshia. <laughs> no, Mr. no, we're going to have first uh, Jeffrey Zhang, right? Yeah. So we'd like to invite him on stage. And uh, so he's, uh, he's from Juniper Networks, a distinguished uh, network engineer. And he's been in this industry for more than 20 years. So he'll be talking about routing in fat trees, something interesting. So we'd like to invite him on stage, please. Good afternoon. Um, so today I'm going to present uh, Rift, a new routing protocol in the data centers. Um, Tony Prezigenda is my co a colleague, and he um, is the main inventor of this new protocol. So why yet another routing protocol, especially for, uh, for data centers? Um, so for some background, let me uh, quickly talk about uh, data center technology ev evolution. On the topology side, it has moved from the original tree topology to today's uh, class topology, or uh, also referenced as a fat trees. Uh, some people call it a spine and leaf uh, architecture. And also, um, it moved uh, from the layer two switching to layer three routing in the underlay. and over the layer three routing underlay, you can provide layer two or layer three uh, uh, overlay service to, to, to the tenants. And then for the layer three underlay routing, 
the routing product itself has evolved from IGB to eBGP, and then now we are pres uh, proposing that to, to, to use this Rift um, uh, as new routing protocol for, for data centers. Uh, the reasons are uh, for scaling, um, convergence, and OPEX uh, considerations. So let's first examine why we have those different protocols to use. Uh, let's start with uh, link state routing um, protocol IGP, whether it's OSPF or ISS. It mainly has three issues. Um, the first one is a failure impact scope also known as blast radius. Imagine you have a mega scale data center network. A single link failure somewhere in the corner of your network will impact your entire network. Every node will learn about that uh, failure uh, or recovery, and then every node will do a SPF recalculation to figure out the, the routes. And additionally, uh, in today's data center networks, networks, there are rich connections and and the existing OSPF and ISS flooding protocol uh, will do non unnecessarily redundant and inefficient flooding. Additionally, um, each node in the network will hold host routes for all the servers. Um, so that all those factors make the uh, IGP not a good solution uh, for large-scale data center networks. As a result, eBGP-based solution was introduced as, um, uh, as a DC underlay routing protocol uh, technology. And there is uh, IETF informational RFC 7938 uh, uh, on that topic. Now, even that solution also has some uh, prominent, uh, prominent issues. Uh, the first one is that it cannot take advantages of well-defined spine leaf net network topology in data centers. For example, ideally, a leaf node or Tor nodes only needs a default route. And the uh, next tier node only needs a default route plus routes for destinations just south of it. However, we cannot do that because there are some failure uh, situations will introduce black hole if you do that, or suboptimal uh, routing. We'll talk about that in, uh, in later. Additionally, uh, in data centers, they are, the eCMP is widely used, large number of eCMP paths. And that also means that when you use eBGP solution, each node will have to keep all the paths for the same prefix learned from different eBGP neighbors. And that becomes a huge burden. Imagine that you have lots, lots, and lots of routes. And for each of them, you have to keep 32 or 64 or even 128 uh, paths learned from different neighbors. And then there are some, uh, you have to explicitly configure eBGP hearing. Um, those are the three prominent issues with eBGP-based solution. There are other subtle issues that make it uh, not that simple as people had originally claimed. I have uh, some uh, slide in the appendix. I will not go through that here. So now we're proposing to use this new Rift protocol to solve the, the, those problems. What exactly is it? In a nutshell, it's link state routing on the northbound and distance vector routing on the southbound. If you look at this picture, on the right side, we are depicting the link state uh, routing northbound. So every node will flood its northbound link state information all the way to the top. So here, uh, the purple node's link state is flooded to the green node and then flooded to the uh, uh, pink node. And, and then on the south direction, the link state of each node is flooded just one hop on southbound and re then reflected or bounced back to the upper layer just by one hop. Those are the, um, the, the, the bounces, uh, what I'm showing here, this bounce and this bounce. 
and that's on the link state part. And then on the distance vector part, we advertise default route, just one hop from pink node to the green node, and then from the green node to the purple node. So now what does that give us? If you look at uh, uh, on the right side where we do the link state routing, um, the pink node has the link state from every node in this network. So from the SPF calculation, shortest path first uh, algorithm, you can learn all the prefixes in the network. And then on this green node here, it only has the link state from the south, which is uh, those three purple nodes. So it only has routes uh, uh, that learned from those three, nothing else on the link uh, state routing side. Additionally, it will also have the um, uh, default routes that it learned from, the, from its northbound neighbor. That is uh, uh, based on the links, uh, uh, distance vector routing. This is what I just uh, talked about. Um, um, so I'm going to skip that. Um, Southbound distance vector, yes, same thing. Now, this is a very important concept in the Rift. I mentioned earlier that with eBGP solution, you cannot take advantage of this uh, network topology by just having this default route. Uh, the reason can be explained here. Oops. Uh, if you look at this, prefix P1 that is attached to the lower right node there. Both all, the, all those uh, uh, green nodes on the right side and then the two pink nodes will know about those prefixes. Now on the left side, they normally they do not have the route for the uh, P1 itself because we, uh, they are just learning the default route from, uh, from uh, the, their north neighbors. Now, let's say this purple node on the left corner needs to send the packet towards P1. What happens is that this node has two routes, two default routes, learned from those two green nodes up there. And it, it would does, uh, uh, do a ECMP hash to decide which one to send packet to. Let's just say it picked the left green node. Similarly, the left green node has two default routes learned from those two pink nodes. Again, you will randomly pick one. Well, it's not random. You just pick one using the hash function. Let's just say that it picked the top pink node. So it sent the packet up there. But then what if this link goes down? from the top node to this green node there. That link going down does not affect any of the nodes to choose which node to send traffic to. As a result, we will have traffic black holing. Now, how do we solve this uh, problem in Rift? Remember that earlier we talked about that the link state is flooded southbound by one hop. In this case, both the pink nodes will flood their link states to the green nodes, and each green node will reflect to the other pink nodes, one hop. Now, the two pink nodes know about each other's link states. So if you look at this uh, bottom pink node, it realized that it can reach the P1 through this no node here. And it also knows that the top link, the top node, pink node, does not have a connection to the next hop for P1. In that case, it knows that it needs to distribute that prefix P1 to the two green nodes. And now, the two green nodes have two routes. One is the default route, 
The other one is a P1 route. The, the, green, the default route is ECMP to both pink nodes, but the P1 route is only pointing to the bottom pink node. Because of that, now when this bottom or the green node need to send traffic to P1, it will always follow the more specific route and send the packet to this bottom pink node. That way, we don't have the traffic black holing issue. So that is the very important concept of automatic deaggregation that allows us to use default routes on the southbound. With that, the, those nodes, well, especially the leaf nodes at the very bottom, they only need a default route. So they reduce the burden significantly on those nodes. Another important uh, feature of Rift is we call it zero touch provisioning. Basically, only the top tier nodes that uh, some people call them super spine, some call them as top of fabric nodes, only those needs nodes, nodes, those nodes need to be configured. And additionally, some nodes that must be leaves at the very bottom or have leaf-to-leaf -leaf connection, they may be configured. Other than that, no more configuration needed on any of those nodes. You just power them up and they will, a uh, cable up, and they will form adjacency in a very well-defined north-south uh, 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 topology. Now, with zero-touch provisioning, data center fabrics, they look like the RAM memory banks. Today, nobody configures RAM banks in your laptops. You just plug them in, and it will work. Now, this Zrift protocol with zero-touch provisioning it will make the DC fabric just like memory banks. When we talk about DC fabric, today the hardware is largely commodity already. And the OPEX must and will also commoditize, and Rift will enable that because of zero-touch provisioning. There are a lot of other features uh, with Rift. Um, optimal reduction and, or, and load balancing of uh, flooding. We, uh, at the very beginning, we talked about the, the IG, IGP protocols today. Uh, their flooding mechanisms does not work very well in the uh, uh, networks with rich connections. Rift does not have that problem. Um, Rift also has uh, built-in mobility support. Uh, some uh, operators find that uh, Rift can also be used in their access networks where their uh, user prefix could actually move from one leaf node to another. And that uh, uh, mobility support is built in with Rift already. Um, it also has the key value store uh, distribution mechanism that can be used for anything. Um, and the fabric bandwidth uh, balancing, um, we talk about that um, the ECMP, um, a node ha has many connections to, to the, its southbound or uh, northbound neighbors. And when you, when you forward traffic, you, you can actually put more traffic on some of the links because you know that link has more bandwidth or the path through that link has more bandwidth. Um, it can uh, have segment routing, uh, segment routing support and we also uh, support leaf-leaf procedures, but only um, for east-westbound uh, east traffic strictly to local prefixes. Um, additionally, we can have policy-guided prefixes that allow us to do more explicit control of the traffic forwarding path. Um, that is now separated into a different uh, uh, documentation, though. So in summary, I'm not going to go through all those uh, uh, advantages or disadvantages, but in summary, it combines advantages of link state routing and distance vector routing. 
and it removes the, dis uh, the disadvantage of those protocols and add, added unique advantages that RIFs bring us. Um, so the next, this slide is about the standardization and in the uh, status and the, and, the, and the industry status on this particular protocol. So in IETF, there is a standard track working group uh, dedicated for RIF protocol itself. Uh, Juniper uh, is a co-chair uh, for their working group. Um, in fact, uh, my, myself is a co-chair for their working group. Uh, we have a very uh, aggressive schedule, a target schedule, um, by next uh, February, uh, February in 2000, 2019, we will have the base protocol standardized, and the young model and other things will force, be forthcoming. We have uh, co-authors from Juniper, Cisco, Comcast, and we have a design team um, with members from Bloomberg, HPE, Mellanox, and open source community. Today, we already have two independent implementations, one is from Juniper, available on box or standalone packages. The standalone packages can be downloaded for public evaluation. And the open source side, uh, Bruno Regisman is implemented uh, using Python, and after he's uh, done with that, uh, we, uh, uh, he will um, pour that uh, uh, into a FRR uh, open source uh, project. So I mentioned there, uh, just some two, uh, there are some uh, slides up, uh, about eBGP solutions nuances. I'm going to go, go through that, but uh, I just want to point out uh, some comparisons here. Um, when you can uh, go through those slides uh, in your leisure time and you can check it out. So again, Rift is a new protocol that IETF is actively working on with uh, uh, vendors, uh, operators' participation, and it combines the advantages of link state routing and distance vector routing and removes those, the different disadvantage of those uh, protocols. And it specifically addresses the problem of existing solutions, whether it's IGP or eBGP solutions. Um, so that's basically my presentation. Um, I welcome any comments or here, now, or offline. Thank you. Uh, we can take a few questions. We have time. Bula, my, my name is Felipe. I just have one question. What are the disadvantages? Disadvantage? Yes. Um, this advantage is that it is a new protocol. Um, there are some operators say that it's new, it's not stable yet, I, my network is fine now, so I won't deploy it for a while. Well, it's, it's, you, can, you can say that uh, for sure, um, but as soon as you have a network that goes to a certain scale, then the issues, scaling and convergence issue of uh, IGP solutions and the BGP solution will become um, uh, obvious. And more importantly, the, 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 the zero touch provisioning is a really, really advantageous for, for this. So yes, if you, you say that, I'm fine with my current solution, sure, that's, that's no problem. But other than that, I think, or at least I don't see that any disadvantage of this solution. Other than that, it's new. That's some, that you, it's a new protocol that you have to, to get comfortable with. Okay. Thanks. 
probably one from me. Uh, uh, what do you think about from the from your real like uh, experiences? Uh, how are the industry like adopting to this protocol? Are there any data centers uh, which are very keen to adopt this protocol and use them, or or just, it is just in the testing phase or something? Right now, it's still in the um, in, in the early stage of this protocol. We have. Uh, uh, implementations, but that's not productized yet. So there is no um, real uh, experience, is, at least on the production networks. But um, the major vendors uh, are working on it. Juniper, Cisco, HPE, and, and the uh, uh, community, uh, open source communities, they are all working on this. And there is a, a working group in IETF working on this. So. It's the interest is clearly there, but real life uh, uh, production level inter, uh, experiences we don't have that yet. But we do have simulation results. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so if no one has any question, I would like to really thank you uh, for introducing this new kind of protocol to the community here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we'll. Now we'll be inviting uh, Mr. Shishio Toshia, right? If that's the right pronunciation. So he's from Arista Networks uh, in Japan, and uh, he's been in the industry for quite a long time, and he'll be here to share experiences in to be open transport. I hope you, you all want to hear something about open transports. And uh, his key focus will be on merchant silicon, yes. right? And uh, vendor ASICs, right? He'll be explaining about his experiences in it. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. My name is Shishu Tsuchiya, Arista Networks Japan. My presentation title is To Be Open Transport. Uh, this is applicability of merchant silicon and vendor ASIC. Arista Networks started business since 2008. At that time, uh, merchant silicon applicable area only on leaf switches. But after that, merchant silicon is growing. In the 2016, uh, merchant silicon supported, uh, one of the merchant silicon, uh, Broadcom Jericho chipset, uh, supported over the one million route with our software. And after that, 2080, uh, Broadcom uh, Tomahawk 3 and Jericho 2, uh, will be supported 400 gigabps. And so uh, it will be applicable on the routing core area. But I'd like to focus today's presentation on the optical transport network. When the merchant silicon applicable the, to the transport, there is some reason minimize merchant silicon and the gross merchant DSP and to be open transport system. I will explain each of item from the next page. One of the reasons is a minimized merchant silicon. Uh, as I already explained, the Jericho chipset already supported one million route, and it has great number of bandwidth, 800 gigabps. And also, uh, it has two core on one tip set. And also, Jericho chipset called Cumulan MX. And Broadcom announced, announced low price and low power model Cumulan AX, like a cut in the core. Cumulan AX supported 300 gigabps, and also it's, it is very deep. So uh, this is compare, comparing Cumulan AX product and the Cumulan MX product. 7080 is Cumulan MX product. 7020 is Cumulan AX product. The number of both, uh, 7080 is 48, 10 gigabps, plus six port, 100 gigabps port. 
And the Kumran AX product, 7020, 48, 1 gigabps, plus 6 port, 10 gigabps. The performance is different, Seven, uh, 720 million pps and 160 million pps, but latency is the same, and the packet buffer is, the packet buffer would help, uh, would help uh, storage network and uh, uh, some Hadoop network, and routing network also, uh, is but similar uh, than Cumulon uh, AX product and the MX product. Most focus point is max power utilization. Uh, 7080 is 405 watt. Uh, 1720 is 155 watt. If we if we calculate the uh, power utilization, then the, uh, this is uh, comparing is much higher, uh, much higher, and it it will be a reflect to the reflect to the customer's uh, operation operation cost. So it so uh, operation cost is very important topic on the service provider access network. So uh, transport equipment have to. Uh, low power utilization. And the next topic, merchant DSP. DSP requires long distance transport over the 40 gigabps and 50, uh, 50 kilometer. Generally, DSP is developing by the WDM vendor in-house but nowadays there is increased purchase merchant DSP and provide the system with it. Merchant DSP is renewing about per 12 to the 18 months, compared with in-house DSP, which needs over two years for renewal. And Fujitsu, Adobe, Coriant, NAC, ZT, and so on, uh, using Merchant DSP. This is uh, how to provide DSP, um, there is a several way, and there is a, some, point, uh, some merit. Uh, In-house is the vendor provide equipment and optics and DSP. In-house can provide new technology and fully customized functions, and it is time to the market. Next one is ACO, Analog Coherent Optics, which is the uh, DSP on the charge, and the optics is separately. Uh, use big, cheap, and easy customize. Proper time to the market, but need some cost compared with in-house. Last one is DCO, Digital Coherent Optics. DSP in the optics. DSP located in the optics. So uh, it needs a cost, but it has flexibility app application and applicability. And its cost depends on the market. If the uh, customer likes this optics, then the uh, cost much, than, uh, much uh, customer will be uh, cheaper than today. And interoperability, interoperability is very good. So uh, DSP is merchant. And if other vendor, uh, if some vendor using same DSP, then the interoperability is complete. This is DCO and ACO market timing and applic application area. Uh, 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 CFT to ACO already uh, de de deployed some area, DWDM switching. 
And、uh, nowadays, CFP2 digital coherent optics using switch and root area.、Uh, this is Japanese environment.、Uh, in Japan, DSF dispersion shift fiber、uh, it requires L band, in band in, instead of C band. This is Japanese, Japan specific requirement, but so it is hard to deploy for non local vendor like us. But in digital coherent adaptive dispersion competition by the digital filter, so、uh, it does not matter even in the DSF section. Last one is the 2B open transport system.、Uh, legacy, this, is, this figure shows legacy transport system. Legacy transport system must be use the same signal vend single vendor, all of transport, and max and the max amp, also controller. But open optical line system. It can be used multi vendor on the open line system.、Uh, this figure,、uh, figure means one, this is using analog coherent optics. Also, this side using, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, side using a trans transponder. And this side also using DCO, and this side also other vendors transponder.、Uh, this is Microsoft,、uh, Microsoft report, its open line system. They、uh, tested their own open line system with Juniper, Cisco, Arista.、Uh, so,、uh, this vendor interoperability. On the、uh, Microsoft Open Line system. And Open Config. Open Config is defined, defined de data model for the service provider operation. They are also defined data model for open transport. Multi vendor provisioning by the same data model and push type monitoring by the telemetry. Open Load. Open Rodem is one of the community, and they、uh, de define the data model and the optical, optical spec with vendor and the telecom, telecom. And the figure shows they are, oh, figure shows they are using Siena transponder, and also they are using、uh, Fujitsu Rodem. And also, they are using Sierra Rodem. They are also using Nokia Transponder.、Uh, so,、uh, the community target is interoperability by marriage vendor. And this is merit of、uh, digital coherent and analog coherent、uh, programmability, and modul modulation, and speed and distance. If we configure it, QS, QPSK modulation, then the speed will be、uh, 100 gigabps and the distance will be 2050 km. If we compare the 6C CAM, and,、uh, then the speed will be、uh, 200 gigabps and the distance will be、uh, 300 gigabps. We can configure programming modulation and frequency by the software. It will be applicable in many use cases. And this is a telemetry story.、Uh, we can confirm some,、uh, some optical transceiver level information, like a power budget. And the power budget is inf informed to the、uh, telemetry collector by the telemetry. So, it would be a change uh, management, uh, optical management system. I will explain some、uh, coherent use cases.、Uh, coherent received by the OSNL 
improvement WDM long haul is first focus point. And metro use case by Rodem and WSS uh, pay as your grow model. Uh, the cost sensitive, uh, cost sensitive and short life cycle required in DCI area. And the, in the DCI area using uh, analog coherent opti optics now. And this is future uh, requirement uh, of a coherent use case. 5G network, which will use metro and backbone area. Backbone area use on the WDM. And the cable access network. Cable access network, cable, uh, cable access network Cox fiber to the home, uh, but for the quality and require the bandwidth they like to use fiber as possible as they can. So uh, they are considering a remote fire solution. Uh, remote fire uh, they uh, extended fiber to the uh, end of the remote fire. And the remote fire changed to the Cox fiber. Uh, cable access network is one of use case of uh, coherent. And the last one is an amp connection because it is great OSNR. This is last slide, my presentation, a conclu conclusion. Merchant silicon would be reached to the finally transport system, and merchant DSP is increasing market share. And DCO DSP has a lot of use case, and costs depend on the market requirement. And the transport system moving to the open from the current closed system by the open line system, open rodem, open config, almost open the right tapping. My presentation is ended. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shishio. So we'll open the floor for questions, please. Anyone there who is interested in open transport? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, if no questions, probably I'll ask you. Uh, probably. Uh, uh, just for information of uh, some of the fellows and some of the guys here who are not, interest, uh, not aware of Merchant Silicon, maybe you can just briefly talk what is like Merchant Silicon. What? Yeah, Merchant Silicon. Yeah. Merchant Silicon. Yeah, you've described the technology, but uh, just something on Merchant Silicon. Merit of the Merchant yeah. Silicon. Yeah. A merchant silicon is a, a merchant silicon is a uh, merchant silicon is a cost effective than, uh, compared than the vendor ASIC. And uh, if uh, if uh, if, uh, if uh, market requires some uh, some uh, uh, function on the merchant silicon, then the uh, merchant silicon is growing. In to the adaptive the market, and uh, as a result, the the cost of the, the equipment much than the uh, cheaper than the today the vendor the ASIC system. Uh, I think it is a merit of the merchant silicon, and if we can, merchant silicon is merchant silicon is merchant. So uh, it, it, the architect is the same within the marriage vendor. So uh, it is easy to the troubleshooting for the operator. I think this is merchant silicon's merit and the strong point in today's uh, operator network. Okay. Uh, thank you. And one more, probably, because we have time. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so to be open transport, like uh, okay. nowadays we see most of the ISPs, they, they just go for one vendor, uh -huh. like Cisco maybe, like uh -huh. for example, with Telecom uh -huh. was Cisco, some just go for Huawei. Uh -huh. uh, what do you think uh, if they start doing open transport, like uh, yeah. there'll be many issues. Even I have faced, there was uh, some Israel company, Red, 
you know, red, red products, RAD. So we were trying to connect red and Cisco. So there was issues there in the optical. So what do you think about uh, would in, would the industry want to go for open transport, like rather than stick to vendor, you know, one uh, vendor? Yeah, as uh, Microsoft report, uh, much uh, much and the DSP can connect to uh, can has an uh, interoperability with the managed vendor, and uh, actually, much and the DSP is only one or two vendor. And uh, uh, the, so, uh, in multi vendor, for example, Cisco provided uh, ACO module, and Arista also provided ACO module, and Juniper also provided. But very similar, they are using a very similar DSP vendor. So, interoperability is sure. Okay. <laughs> and I think it is no problem. We, we are already tested in the customer side by the marriage vendor. But it is a no problem, mostly no problem. So it is easy. I, I think it is easy for today, okay. open transport. Thank you. We still have time, 10 minutes. Anyone, any questions, any curiosity out there about open transport systems? OK, there's one there. Thank you. Paula from Tonga. <clears throat> Do you think in the future or any protection for the open uh, something like that? Is there any open up for vulnerabilities or stuff like that in terms of trying to efficient and uh, improve the performance of the communication? For example, if two different vendors mm -hmm. trying to uh, compatible or stuff like that, mm -hmm. do you think this trying to, 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 to open up for easier traffic can cause any vulnerabilities for the attacks or something like that? So uh, I think it, uh, it is the com uh, community of the important and like an open rodem, like an open rodem attendee come from the some vendor and the tele telecommunication company. So uh, I like to say to, uh, to the operator, uh, operator have to raise opinion to the uh, community uh, to sure the interoperability and the performance improvement on the open network. Is it my, <laughs> is it my opinion? Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Does the answer satisfy you? That's all right. You were concerned about uh, uh, security kind yes, of thing, yes, right? Yes, yeah. possible, security. possible. Uh, yeah. Because he's thinking, I think, what about these possible attacks security. in the open transport system? So, uh, yeah. On, on the open transport system, they are using MaxSec. MaxSec is the defined IEEE, and my uh, my MaxSec is also interoperability is in the management. Is it? <laughs> Max, Max, That's all right. okay. So thank you very much, uh, Shishio. So now we'd like to invite uh, Mr. Save Nader Bodia. We call him Save. He's from ICANN. So he'll be speaking on something very interesting that is about to happen in October. Uh, and that's uh, the new root zone and DNSSEC uh, key, KSK, the, the key signing. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, Shabnil. Um, the topic for today is uh, on current state of the root zone, DNSSEC key role. Uh, this was supposed to be presented by my colleague, Edward Lewis, and he sent his apologies that he couldn't make it to this presentation. So um, the basics really is this, this talk is related to the domain name system. We understand that this is uh, RIR uh, uh, meeting, but uh, it's quite important that uh, we also highlight this uh, event or this um, uh, initiative that uh, ICANN is putting through as well and to, to share with the internet, greater internet community, especially since uh, you know most of you here are members as well of APNIC um, who run ISPs in your countries. And if you are doing uh, 
uh, DNSSEC uh, validation, and this is important to share. So DNSSEC release for DNS uh, security extensions. Uh, it's the addition of uh, digital signatures to data using a hierarchy of asymmetric cryptographic keys to achieve massive scale. And it's in two parts. One is the signing for, to generate signatures and the validation for checking signatures. So two of the cryptographic roles defined for keys is the key signing key, which is the KSK, a key that signs a bundle of, of other keys, and the zone uh, signing key, a key that is used to sign data. And the root zone DNSSEC uh, KSK is the, most, uh, is the top most cryptographic key in the DNSSEC validation hierarchy, and there's a public portion of the KSK, which is a config configuration parameter in DNS validating resolvers. So uh, there has been one functional operational root zone DNSSEC uh, KSK called the KSK 2010. Uh, this was way back in 2010 uh, when it was implemented. So from 2010 till uh, now, there's nothing else that has been done. Um, so a new KSK will be put into production later this year, and it's called uh, KSK 2017. And an orderly succession of, for continued uh, smooth operations is the, the target here. So uh, I think for many of us who do updates for our passwords, uh, and what we, it's important to know that no, no update has been done since the introduction of the KSK 2010 key. So operators of the DNSSEC uh, recursive uh, servers may have to have some work. Uh, they need to you know as little as possible. They have to review uh, configurations, or they have to look at the installations of the KSK 2017. So. KSK 2017, it's not a typo. It's just a result of a delay uh, that happened. It was because of the, um, the, role, uh, the approach of the KSK uh, rollover is the rollover process emerged from plans developed in 2015, uh, really um, based on the automated updates of DNSSEC trust anchors known as RFC 5011. And the re recommendations uh, from that uh, is for operators to rely on this RFC 5011 and some of the uh, crucial milestones uh, have already passed, and we are still adhering to it to the final phases. So the, in, in the future, we're likely to rely on it again. So these are the, the dates for those important milestones. If we were to have rolled out this uh, KSK in uh, 2017, but it didn't happen. And so uh, to update you, um, in 2011, uh, October, uh, we, there is a ten this is a tentative date that we will put it into pro production. And on the dates of when to revoke the KSK 2010, it's to, to be decided and uh, finally to remove it. So why the updated milestones? Um, when the rollover uh, started, there was no way to measure resolver configurations. Uh, during the project, a new measure was invented and implemented and rolled out. The new measure results were at best confusing and concerning uh, to the communities. And so the rollover was paused, and so we needed to look at these new measurements again. Uh, the measure, uh, it was a, a readiness measure invented in the IETF. Again, uh, this is titled the Signaling uh, Transactor Knowledge in DNS Security Extensions, also known as RFC 8145. It quickly turned into code and then combined with a not noticeable tech refresh. Now, when we look at the data from uh, those measurements, uh, the green you'll see is the number of sources that are reporting the trust anchor data. And the, the red line here is the number of sources reporting only KSK 2010. And the black is the percentage of uh, sources reporting only KSK uh, 2010. And we see that uh, it was buffering around the 7% the mark. So the, the very sign uh, researchers looking at the two uh, root servers, they noticed that the, the number of DNSSEC validators uh, having only KSK 2010 was un uncomfortably high, around the 7% mark. And this was con also confirmed through a separate ICANN uh, research. They had feeds from uh, data from nearly all the root servers. And the rates of only KSK 2010 seemed to rise over time as more reporters uh, uh, came online. So the early, early analysis that they did was the, the brute force investigation, um, the contact of the IP sources of the alarm, and it, it proved difficult. Uh, in the instances when uh, there were responses, uh, there was no significant syst systematic uh, reason. 
many dynamic addresses raising questions about the known use cases and running a DNS server on a, on a dynamic address. Uh, was the data clean? Uh, there was doubt about the measurement's uh, accuracy, and we're looking for some systematic costs. So the decision really on uh, trying to pause the rollover because, uh, because of the data that was uh, uh, in 2017, uh, from what they saw in the measurements, they, they paused that and because of the, due to the uncertainties. So we, we try to say that it's not the fault of the project uh, or execution. And um, you know, ICANN has engaged the community for ways forward. We've done a lot of uh, outreach and uh, uh, working with the community to, to see how we can get a proposed updated plan and, and ask for public, uh, public comment as well. And, and what we did is, was also to open this up to external research on, on the issue. Uh, we don't have all the data, and we can't and shouldn't in some cases. So from, uh, this is the graph that they've just produced uh, last month. Uh, the progress of last month is that we're seeing that it's still hovering around the 7% uh, mark, the, those that are reporting on, only on uh, KSK 2010. Um, we wanted to share uh, also uh, that, you know, if there are people that are interested in, in the graphs, uh, there's a link that uh, you can see here. And it also is a list, there's also a list of uh, addresses that uh, reported the KSK 2010 only. Now, how do we recognize this uh, KSK 2017 uh, key? Uh, the key tag is 2326, uh, uh, sorry. And the, re and the delegation uh, signer uh, resource record for this KSK 2017 is, uh, is as displayed here. And um, on, the, on the resource uh, record, um, this is how it also looks in the, in, as, a, as a cryptographic key. And on the current state of the system, uh, we'd like to say that sunny, uh, as in sunny day scenario, uh, the, the KSK is gonna be changed under, under good conditions. Uh, we'll take a slow and, and, and cautious approach and following the automated updates of DNSSEC Trust Anchors uh, protocol known as RFC 5011. So one of the things I think we need to be sure about, it's the most appropriate point here regarding automated updates, uh, that you know, it requires 30 days to adopt the new key. So um, you know, looking at now till October uh, 11th, you know, 30 days is already uh, long gone. So if you, if you have to do updates, now you have to consider maybe doing a manual update. So we assume that the DNSSEC is uh, operating and configured to run uh, the KSK rollover following the automated updates process. Um, all the validators uh, should already list the new uh, KSK as trusted. And if the KSK 2017 is not there now, as we say, manual updating is needed. And how can one tell or how does one fix this? There's um, examples here as well on um, you know, how you can um, uh, validate. Uh, you send a query to dnssec-fail.org.a uh, with dnssec OK. And the response uh, you should receive is the serve fail at dnssec and to, to prove that the validation is enabled. Um, if the responses um, holds an IPv4 address space, then um, uh, the dnssec validation is not enabled. This is an example of um, one of the uh, responses. So we see that in, in green, uh, that means DNSSEC validation is enabled for uh, this test. And showing the IPv4 address, DNSSEC validation is disabled. So how to see whether KSK 2017 is trusted? Again, it's tool dependent. We've got uh, uh, the link there to, to test that. and. Uh, there's two list, uh, listed trust tankers for the root zone. Um, uh, one is KSK 27 key ID 2326. Um, if you don't see this, uh, the validator will fail beginning October uh, 11. So if you have uh, customers and if you did, uh, if you did uh, implement validation, some of them would probably just uh, fail to resolve. So KSK 2010 key ID is 19036. Uh, and so, yeah. If you don't see this, the validator is not working now. So uh, as a tool, if you're uh, using bind, this is how it's going to be displayed. And uh, if you're using unbound, uh, look out for, for those parameters in there. 
So what if KSK2017 is, is, is not trusted? Again, tool dependent. Uh, we've provided that uh, link there to, to test it out. And um, if, if, if the wrong, what is the symptoms of the wrong trust tanker? Uh, DNSSEC validation fails for everything then, uh, resulting from an inability to build a chain of trust. So all DNS responses uh, will uh, serve fail, and even if the target zone is not DNSSEC signed. And we need to look at the logs for validation failures. So um, we've put together some uh, resources here on where to get uh, KSK27 manually. Um, please look at uh, uh, these sites if, if you're doing DNSSEC validation. Uh, to see whether uh, you will be ready uh, when, when the key signing keys happen. So in the future, uh, we know that uh, you know, there should be continuous updates in the future. Uh, uh, the revocation of the KSK 2010 uh, will happen, and this, all, this will be automated updates. Uh, as you're saying, there will be more KSK uh, rollovers, so it's, good, it's a good practice to, to start this if, if you're doing validation and to see that uh, you can use these tools. And, and here's more tools that, uh, and, and resources that has provided by ICANN. Um, as, as these slides will be available uh, on APNIC uh, website, do please uh, go through these, uh, these links. A final word uh, to anyone operating a DNSSEC uh, validating uh, recursive server. Uh, we ask you to please prepare now. Uh, it's kind of getting late. Uh, do not wait any longer, so act now. Uh, automated uh, updates will not have enough time because it's now September 2018 and October 11 is the rollout date. Um, you have to update your code and the configurations. And uh, the final formal, uh, final decision to resume the rollover hasn't been made. Uh, there's still uh, the ICANN board that's going to make the decision to, to roll out in October 11, but you know, there is uh, no operational risk in being prepared. Uh, the concerns fade, fade when there is no evidence of unprepared systems. So um, thank you again. Um, this is the uh, links and uh, email addresses to contact uh, the KSK rollover team in ICANN. And uh, if you need help, please uh, do reach out. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Save. So we'll open the floor for any questions. Again, uh, Felipe, I'm from uh, Fiji. Thank you, Sabe, for your uh, presentation. How many economies in, in the Pacific are doing DNS validation? Yeah, uh, from the ISP resolver side, I don't think we have uh, the numbers for that. But uh, I can say that with the country code top-level domain registries who, who we uh, work closely with, uh, at the CCTLD level, there's about 80% um, of the CCTLDs in the region, they have uh, uh, signed their zones So as a, as a CCTLD. Uh, here, like in, here in New Caledonia, like .nc has signed the zone. Uh, in terms of the ISPs who are conducting uh, or who are who've switched on uh, DNSSEC validation, I don't think we'll have that number. But an important uh, point that I want to probably raise here as well was that we used, uh, we worked and closely with APNIC, we collaborated with them, and they supplied uh, the AS numbers of uh, ISPs in the region. Uh, from that, we were able to determine how many uh, of them were probably doing validation. And the team uh, from, our technical team has reached out to them uh, through emails. Uh, uh, one of the things that we are trying to, to do is uh, make sure that we can contact those people. So if you are an APNIC member who have responsibility over the, your APNIC account, and you know, please do look, look uh, uh, for emails from uh, ICANN that have uh, already contacted you, and also to make that uh, connection with, with ICANN if, if you are one of those that have been contacted. Thank you. Uh, I have another question. 
It's just regarding the, um, if you are not doing DNS uh, sec validation, after this rollover and you tend to do DNS validation, the new key will be assigned? Yes, uh, if, if the, if the key KSK rollover does happen after October 11, that is the new key that's coming into effect. And if you, run, if you do try to implement DNSSEC, then that is the uh, KSK 2017 key that you will be using. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, so any more questions from the floor as we have time? We still have many, quite a lot of time. Uh, anyone running DNS service in the Pacific here? So, no questions? Uh, maybe just something for, uh, just for curiosity. Uh, why do you still call it DNSX 17? Like, 2017, it's 2018. Yes, in, in, my, in my presentation I did say that, um, that it's not a typo. Uh, it was uh, originally planned to be rolled out in uh, uh, 2017, so one year ago. Uh, and because of the concerns of the, the measurements and uh, the data that was received, it was, uh, we, th we thought it was prudent probably to just push it back another year. And so this is why we are doing the rollout, uh, the rollover in uh, October 2018. So the key has been developed from 2015 onwards and, and that's 2017 key. Okay. Uh, so initially the reason that uh, the DNSSEC uh, KS key was postponed was because uh, I can believe that the there are many ISPs who and they were not ready, right, at that time. So now you're fully confident that, uh, uh, according to your data that you have received, so it's the right, the right time to really do it. Or? There have been uh, so many uh, discussions uh, within the community about this, and uh, I think if some of the guys here that are pretty active in that community, or maybe George, I see that George has come through, and uh, he might be in the best position to answer this from a technical standpoint. George Michelson from APNIC. When, when we were first as a DNS research community asked to look into what we could see, there were a couple of big problems. The first is that there is not a good mechanism to signal, or there wasn't a good mechanism to signal what resolvers do. So we had to invent a way to say, in the act of doing service, doing queries, can you give us a signal of whether you know about the new key? And that took a little while, and two different techniques were in, invented in the standards framework. One of them got deployed partly by resolvers, but there was a small bug. And so a lot of data was collected that was half right, half wrong, but we didn't know. And that data had a very, very worrying signal. It said, look at the number of people who are doing validation, look at the number of people who don't seem to recognize the new key. And no one realized there was an underlying bug and that actually, if you'd fixed that bug, the numbers were quite a lot different from what we thought. That was part one. Part two, when we started analyzing the addresses that were saying, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it, a lot of them were VPN. A lot of them were overlay networks, private VPN networks that were behaving in a very non-standard manner. They weren't actually telling us about the real public global DNS. So the reason it was delayed is that we didn't have good measurement systems. The measurement systems we had we misunderstood some of what they said, and they had some bugs. And when we reanalyzed the data, it's actually not impossible, if we'd said that at the time, that the ICANN board would have felt a lot more confident about going ahead with the deployment. One of the problems here is that it is actually impossible to be confident there will be no consequent damage. When you talk about a global network with three or four billion people, and you say, five nines, even at five nines, the number of people who potentially are affected badly by this in 
numeric terms is very large. So the idea that we can have no damage, no risk, it just doesn't exist in the wider public network. But we live in a time of amplified concern and it's extremely hard for anyone, ICANN board, operators, public interest people, anyone to say, no, oh, there's no risk here. It's very hard to say that. So everyone's saying, oh, there's an unknown amount of risk here. And what we're actually finding is our measurement systems are looking for a signal that is so tiny, it's underneath the variances in how well we can measure what is going on. The noise in the signal that we're looking for is bigger than the signal of some kind of damage. And I think that knowledge has changed the agenda slightly for the ICANN board, for the people who have to sign off on this, because they now realise we just can't tell in advance that there's going to be a huge risk because the signal we're getting is less than the variation in normal behaviour in the system. There is probably going to be a problem. It's probably going to be very small. Lots of eyes are going to be on this, but I, I think it's going to be okay. But that's a very informal statement. There's not a strong formal statement. We know exactly what's going to happen. We just have a broad feeling it's not going to be that spectacular. Thank you very much. So that means uh, we are pretty much hoping that everything will just go well, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any more questions? Uh, any last questions? We got 15 minutes uh, before the next session. The next session is on uh, data analysis, data gathering and analysis buff. Any more questions about DNS? Uh, right. Um, uh, probably one last one, just for information of the fellows, because I'm also representing the fellows here. Uh, what about if some of the ISPs, they are not running DNSSEC, so? Yeah, uh, if there are uh, network operators or ISPs that are not uh, validating any DNSSEC, then they don't have to worry about this so change. Good about yeah. So, and if they are running DNSSEC, they must 100% this sign yeah. up. They just have to make sure that they are running the 2017 key. Yeah, and the last question, probably, uh, you said that uh, um, because the time is quite low and we cannot do automatic now, so now probably it's obvious that everyone has to do manual manual update, right? Because it's September 14 to October. Okay, great. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, session here. It was a technical session. I hope uh, uh, you guys enjoyed and learned from it. And we'd like to thank uh, Mr. Shishio Tushia, Mr. Jeffrey Zhang, and uh, Savinada from ICANN. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll probably, you can do something. And uh, from 5.30, there'll be another session. And then we'll have the uh, show.